Hi, welcome to Black Angus Reviews. I'm Black Angus, and today I'll be talking about Why Film Matters, a discussion of Disney Star Wars and the Solo Soycott. So until the 20th century, ideals offered against popular opinion were hard to come by, and even harder to spread. The Gutenberg Press didn't alleviate the pains of copying books by hand until about the 1500s with Martin Luther's Bible. A great example of the cost of this reality is Viking culture. The story of Beowulf was put to paper by monks, and we can assume anything too outlandish for their beliefs was edited or omitted as well as your mythologies in the Edda, which may be corrupted from their origins, as Vikings who did write were by then converts to Western norms. With the exception of Christendom having a vast empire united by a few common tongues and thus easily spreading, radical new ideas were subject to religious or governmental allowance. This is something we largely take for granted today, with the modern world being widely literate and educated. So after the printing press, the next major breakthrough was film. For a time, they were a novelty only the rich could afford, um, going to vaudeville-type shows and whatnot. But soon, they started to become uh, more inexpensive and available to the public. Uh, and stories began to form. Then camera angles started to change how we understood those stories. And effects began to redefine the stories we could tell, like um, Trip to the Moon. So yeah, go forward to 1925, post-revolutionary Russia, which um, after the First World War was now the communist regime we know as USSR. They developed the first film school as we know it, and Sergei Eisenstein was a student there, and he began experimenting with what we now know as montage, the art of editing different scenes to tell a story that uh, scenes on their own might not tell. Uh, he's trying to elicit very strong reaction or to tell a story beyond what you saw. Alfred Hitchcock better established this with the following example I'm about to delineate. Um, imagine a scene of a man, and he's looking onward, and you cut to the next scene as a woman with her child, and then you cut back and you see the man start to smile a little bit, and you start to think of him as kindly, as someone who appreciates motherhood and, and children, and you just think of a kind old grandpa, perhaps. <clears throat> so then he shows another example. You keep those two scenes of the old man, but in the middle you insert a new image, a new shot, and that would be a woman in a bikini. And once you look at the old man smiling, you, your perception of him completely changes. You think, of him like, oh, he's got sex on the brain, he's a pervert. Hitchcock perfected this type of storytelling through editing uh, in his famous Psycho shower scene, which was also aided with um, climactic music. Lastly, something uh, somewhat tied to editing is subtext. Uh, a literary example of subtext would be how the course of action in Animal Farm is a sort of illusion or allegory or whatever to communism. So in film, we see the perfect example of subtext being the Godfather. Uh, when Michael Corleone gets his, he's at his nephew's baptism, he's also becoming baptized in the title role of Godfather. He, he assumes his father's role while you see various scenes of hits being taken out uh, on family enemies, enemies of the business. Another great example in film with subtext is Fight Club. Um, the course of events, of course, are just showing this guy kind of going crazy, and then you learn that he's got a split personality or what have you that uh, he sees as a different person. But in reality, what you can take away from it is a, a lesson about how consumerism kind of ruins our lives, it takes over our lives. Uh, or, uh, in my case, I see it as an example of how masculinity is at odds with modern society and how we kind of suppress it and whatnot. So you see, there can be various different interpretations with subtext in a good film, such as Fight Club. So yeah, so now I want to get more into Disney with subtext. Great example is Lion King. You know, it's an adaptation of Hamlet, but when you dig deeper and try to find the meaning, it's really a lesson in 
the natural order of things. The circle of life is very prominent, um, but also you see the course of events with Scar uniting the lions and the hyenas. Now you have a surplus of predators and they've ravaged the land. So the world that you're seeing is now in chaos. And the only remedy is to balance out, to, to right the wrongs that Scar has enacted. Um, and it's kind of a lesson of uh, accepting your place in society or in the world. And it's kind of depressing when you really think about the overall lesson that you can learn from a Lion King. So yeah, so move forward to more modern day um, with Zootopia. So you have this story of a rabbit, um, a species, uh, well a person, but also a species who is not accepted in society as a law enforcer. And so she's got this sort of naturalized prejudice against her being a, a bunny, not so much a female, but being a bunny. And so she has an uphill climb that you're, you're watching unfold. The overarching subtext, though, is a critique of prejudice. Um, the plot relies on a story where predatory animals are feared by society, uh, they think that they're bound by their biology as predators and kind of justifies in the quote-unquote victim population uh, their profiling. And the subtext is supposed to reflect this growing political consensus of black people uh, and other minorities being profiled by the police uh, in modern day. I think this came out in 2014, and of course we were dealing with Michael Brown and a few other cases getting a lot of publicity. Uh, the problem, though, with that whole narrative in Zootopia is that it's got this racial allegory to it um, without being aware of how it's presenting it. Uh, they're in this society where predator and prey are united and they do well and stuff, but the fear of their biological predisposition as predators is actually justified. And so you get this really flawed storytelling that is totally unaware of itself. Um, and despite the intent of the film to, you know, tell this very simplistic story, like racism is bad. You can't judge a book by its cover and whatnot. Um, it actually shows a, a world that can justify that, that, uh, reasoning so yeah, with that, uh, I like to use the opportunity to segue into the specific film of Solo, A Star Wars Story, and why there's a Star Wars fandom that's uh, boycotting Solo with the soycott. Uh, so the fallout and divide in fandom, uh, it has many reasons, and actually is a response to The Last Jedi. Uh, Last Jedi is a film that begs you to accept inconsistencies uh, within its own saga, the bastardization of a pop culture icon, false diversity in a new trilogy where all the decisions are essentially done by white characters and the propping up of females uh, at the expense of males, which in the previous six uh, episodic films was never the case. And yes, there were a high number of males to female ratio um, with only three main characters that we see that are female with uh, Mon Mothma playing a small role in the government. Leia is, of course, the princess in general, and Padme in the prequels being a senator and love interest for Anakin. But uh, even when there was conflict between those females and the male counterparts, it was never truly adversarial or depreciating. Uh, and you get that especially with Haldo belittling Poe Dameron for just wanting to have a plan, a course of action to save people uh, when he's demonized for getting him in a huge mess, but she does nothing to alleviate it. Uh, so the latest fallout or whatever since Last Jedi uh, that can be tied with Solo itself is making Lando a pansexual under the guise of representation. So Lucasfilm seems to not realize that Star Wars has been for everyone across the universe already you know all you have to do is watch behind the scenes footage for the saga especially the prequels and you see how they created these uh, wardrobes and these characters as a celebration of all sorts of cu cultures uh and just the general storytelling especially of the first uh, chronologically first star wars film a new hope is 
the monomyth perfected. It's Joseph Campbell put into film his studies of a general overarching theme of a hero across all cultures. Star Wars is inherently celebratory of all cultures. Um, so yeah, now you have Star Wars with Lucasfilm at Disney adding these identity politics whenever and wherever they can, as I assume they think it will make them money. Uh, but people are learning to see past the visuals and realize it's a front. You know, you can't claim diversity and representation when you have the black guy be essentially a space janitor and the Asian tri chick um, be a kamikaze of sorts. Not to mention, adding sex in this universe is idiotic. Sex is, unless there was a new empire of sorts that was condemning people just based on sexuality, if you try to make a sort of X-Men allegory, then you could, you know, make that pertinent. But this isn't Moonlight, it's not Brokeback Mountain, it's not a single man where sex is the core obstacle a character is dealing with. Uh, you know, it's a kind of age-old story of good versus evil. And so, you know... In Star Wars, the only people that we know explicitly have sex have that be a direct cause of their negative uh, path or story. With Anakin and Padme, you have Anakin who he can't be having sex because he's in a celibate, um, somewhat like priest order, what have you. Uh, the Jedi are abstinent. And there seems to be a, a scene or two where Padme has this conflict of being pregnant and being in the Senate. So it appears, I need to rewatch it, it appears that even in the Senate, you can't be having children. And it's a big controversy. And then, of course, episode seven and onward so far, uh, the big crux of the matter is Kylo Ren, who is a product of Han and Leia's consummation. Um, see, I've talked about it before. The complexities of sex that you see in Star Trek can't really be applied to Star Wars because that's never uh, a point of contention in the story. You know, you're just throwing a wrench into essentially a formulaic storytelling experience. It's escapism at its finest. So yeah, Disney should know better. Um, they've been really good through history at having, um, they wanted to plug non-heteronormative characters into stories they've done it really well like Ferdinand uh, in that adaptation he's kind of a sissy bull um, and many people take that as a example of a gay character or the skunk from Bambi where he seems to be very effeminate as a male skunk and taken aback in a lustful or loving way with Bambi uh, so people see that as an allegory for closeted gay man living a hetero married life um, to cover, you know, their secret and to just conform out of necessity. So Disney has a really good track record overall with subtext of a gay character, of using sex on a character and not being overt. Um, but they also had controversies, like The Little Mermaid had the artist uh, essentially draw a penis into the, I think, Coral Castle or whatever in the cover. Uh... And the one that really pissed me off was Beauty and the Beast, uh, the 2017 remake, where LeFou, they, they explicitly said it to the public, he's our first purposely, explicitly gay character. And then you watch the movie, and you see it's a big exploitive queer-baiting uh, tactic to get sales. Um, LeFou's a horrible gay stereotype. As of late, uh, one good example I can say that Disney has done with representation that's potentially inflammatory in the public is in Frozen. There's the gay shopkeeper, or we assume gay, um, as he says, high family or a low family, and you see a man with four kids in the sauna, and uh, I can't tell if he's saying high family to customers or high family to his family, but... If their intent was for, you know, subtext of a gay man being a successful business owner and family man, I think they did that well because it's never a point of, you know, contention or what have you. It's just a plug, show you uh, gay people have families. And like it or not, 2014, the Supreme Court ruling, that's a fact of life. Gay people can adopt, and that's fine. And it's okay to show that in film as it's reality. But we need to be hesitant as Disney, historically, will do whatever will get them money. 
You have things like Dumbo with the crows, who are clearly black people. You have the imagery of Native American stereotypes and Peter Pan. Um, so yeah, Disney throughout history has been very chameleon. Uh, oh, I also forgot um, Song of the South, of course, is one of their shameful things that they try to hide and sweep under the rug. So yeah, coming back to pansexualism and making Lando pan, uh, the one thing I want to do is define pansexualism or pansexuality. Uh, to be clear, it is not pedophilia or child molestation. It's not bestiality or other perversions that may be applied out of uh, a general public hysteria with this. Um, essentially, pansexuality is being attracted to people uh, beyond their gender, that gender is not a determinant, uh, as even in bisexuality, you generally have a predisposed preferred sex. So yeah, I wanted to be clear about this point, uh, because I feel people are overreacting and aren't aware of general storytelling in sci-fi, especially in film, that we know and love. So a few examples that can be applied to pansexuality in sci-fi would be Blade Runner, where... He doesn't, in the end, he doesn't know if he's a replicant or not, and he doesn't care. And in Blade Runner 2, 2049, he has a child who's a replicant hybrid, so he's mated with this humanoid robot sentient being. Um, Westworld, both the film in the 70s and the show, explicitly shows sex with robots. Um, you also have, of course, the iconic Captain Kirk, who he's hetero in nature, but he still goes after different species sentient beings through his uh, time in Star Trek. So yeah, I'm defining these because um, these are well-beloved sci-fi classics, um, respectively. And no one's had a problem with it because no one's applied pansexuality to that. Although that essentially is really the case. Um, in Star Wars Rebels, I would even offer that Kanan and Hera seem to have a relationship that's more than just being friends. There seems to be some sort of romantic collection, uh, connection there. And Kanan is a human, and Hera is a Twi'lek. And sure, they may be compatible sexually, but I doubt they'd be able to reproduce. And I think we don't think of that um, because we still see these sentient creatures as equals, so we don't really think about the actual relationships between species. Um, so I just want to be clear that we're not reacting to Lando being pan for the sake of it being pan as the inflammatory uh, cause in our response. Uh, from my point of view, the problem of making Han pansexual, as most people would see, is that it retroactively changes how you view that character when you're introduced to him in episode 5. Before you viewed Lando as hetero because the way he comes on to Leia and that seems to be a potential wedge driven in between Leia and Han who we're kind of rooting for at this point of the movie. They've established a connection and so at this point briefly sex uh, becomes a sort of key point for the storytelling with Han, Luke, uh, no, sorry, Han, Leia, and Lando uh, as there may be a split between the characters that we've just joined together. And so for a short amount of time, sex is pertinent to the character's storylines. Uh, but they take a back seat very quickly to the main plot lines of Han and Leia trying to escape the Empire and then being used for bait to get Luke to try to take him before the Emperor. And that's how we get the duel uh, on Cloud City. So making Lando now Pando uh, was a huge mistake. Uh, it seems to be just a virtue signaling type PR move to get more publicity. And it would seem, from the initial projections of $170 million for the four-day Memorial Day weekend for Solo, to then getting cut down to 130 to 50 to then getting cut down to like 115 Now, on Sunday, they've only got $83 million so far and are only projecting a max of $110 million payout for Solo. Um... So it seems like a bad PR stunt that they might try to use as an excuse, as we've seen Disney deflect why fans hate their movies before. Um, it seems that they're going to try to spin this now, where it's like, oh, you think 
because you're not seeing the movie because Lando is pansexual now. You're a bigot. And so I'll just be new fuel for them as today, uh, given the news of the low returns being almost half of what they tried to say they would be. They're trying to spin it as Star Wars fatigue. And this is from the same Disney company who has Marvel. We saw Thor in November last year, Black Panther in February, and then Infinity War in May of this year. So there's no such thing as fatigue. It's just a distrust of part of the Umbrella Corporation of Disney, that being Lucasfilm. So now we get to the soycott, the solo boycott, and why f fans are boycotting solo. And I've read a lot of spoilers, watched lots of reviews from people I like and dislike. Um, I have a well-rounded idea of the movie, um, and I've watched the trailers myself. I, if it wasn't for the Star Wars logo on it, I wouldn't really have interest in it, along with the story is one that no one wants to really know about. And from what I gather, it does nothing to really build the lore, and it seems kind of a desperate move with uh, the cameo that's plugged into the end of the film. Uh, on top of that, you just have the response of fans who are tired of the bad writing and the identity politics that have been placed in Star Wars. Now, films can have messages and have slants in their storytelling and in their subtext, whether, however obvious they are. With that being said, uh, in Star Wars, besides perhaps uh, being a in some ways an allegory of Vietnam, as George Lucas has talked about, Politics are essentially devoid in Star Wars. Uh, politics being modern day, real life politics, not the Senate or the Emperor. However deep the movies go into the politics of their universe uh, is well and good. And if there's some allegory subtext of things, if you're not being preachy and having a slant in your story to just garner people to one side of thinking, uh, there's no real problem in that. But it's problematic when your new stories that you're making are set 30 years after a civil war and we had established governments, an empire, and a rebellious republic forming. And now we're 30 years in the future. We don't know what's going on. And yet you want to plug actual politics and political themes into the story. It's nonsense. So now I want to get back to subtext in film and why film is important diversity in comics talks a lot about how comics need to be apolitical and he gets a lot of def uh, deflectors saying well comics have always been political uh and he admits like yes they a lot of times tell political stories or they're built from political times but in general they don't tell a slanted one-sided viewpoint uh, when he says things should be apolitical, that's what he means. So a great example in film of being apolitical with subtext would be The Dark Knight. The general concept of how Batman is adapted in the Dark Knight trilogy is analyzing post-9-11 America and applying it to a superhero who uses vigilantism and prototype military weapons and whatnot to combat crime and to walk that fine line between being a criminal and being a uh, protector of justice. And so you see this through a sort of allegory com that's compared to um, the Patriot Act that was enacted after 9-11 where we can wiretap anybody if uh, the government sees fit in the name of fighting terrorism. And so you see that with the Dark Knight, how he has this new technology that he built off of Lucius's uh, sonar where he can sur survey the whole city if need be at the expense of everyone's freedom in trying to combat the Joker. And you see how this is a big moral dilemma for Lucius. And because of that, that's why Batman trusts him and whatnot. But it's really an apolitical analysis for you to take in as the viewer to agree with or disagree with uh, the motives and the means and the ends of those means. Another example of apolitical subtext in the film is Captain America Civil War. With Tony Stark, Iron Man, you have the argument for liberalism that nations should have control over what happens within their borders and decide whether they want the Avengers' help uh, in their causes or not. 
And opposite of him, you have Captain America, who has a mixed ideal of realism with his own moral code of deontology. Uh, essentially, he just wants to do the right thing, and he fears the agendas of nations can change and thus may harbor enemies of the world, and therefore sovereign borders should not necessarily be respected in that case. In the, f in the end, this film is ambiguous with answers. It's letting you decide if Tony's right, if Captain America's right, if both are right, and there's really no easy answer. The whole thing is ambiguous, and that's what works when you have political subtext in a film. Now, in contrast, one of the most iconic films concerning political propaganda with subtext is Sergei Eisenstein's Battleship Potemkin. It's about a 1905 mutiny in the Soviet what would become the Soviet Union. Um, there's only one real central figure that you follow, but he's really part of a group, and he's essentially a martyr for a cause. And you end up rooting for the group against the government in the film. And it turns out it's a communist propaganda film. It was so influential to propaganda that Joseph Goebbels of Nazi Germany used it for a template for propaganda film going forward in Nazi Germany. So you see from this final example how important what you put in a film can be, however seemingly harmless the genre or the intended audience may be. In essence, film is the new book. It's the most effective way to reach a mass audience, short of the internet, and a great tool for subversive intents. When a company tries to ostracize and isolate a large part of its fan base due to its gender or race, the fans may indeed oblige them, and they're going to speak with their dollar. So far in the first week of Solo, we've done just that to Lucasfilm, all in the hopes of a change in leadership, hopefully with a person who is a fan and doesn't have an ulterior motive aside from being given money for entertaining us and with the hope of giving us coherent stories. It's because of this that Solo, a film that sounds pointless but enjoyable, is having to suffer. So with Memorial Day drawing to a close, we can sit back and assess the wrecked, soy-drenched disaster that is the Solo box office with hope for change to come. Given the reception to the change to Lando's character, maybe Lucasfilm will know not to play identity politics with this. Because if they really cared about pan representation, they would make a new and unique character and let that character stand on their own and not rob the fans of their lifelong perception of a beloved character. But given their track record, I expect it to go like this. It's going to be a plan where they thought the fans would cling to a character so much that they would, uh, wouldn't care no matter what they did to them. Or they thought this film would flop and plug this so they could say it fell due to racist bigots. These people never quit, and they're always looking to spin bad news to blame the fans for their problems. So in closing, I'd just like to say cheers and goodwill for our soycott during Solo, and going forward into Episode 9 and beyond. So, if you like what I've discussed today and want to see more, be sure to like and subscribe. Feel free to comment below your thoughts and your suggestions. They're greatly appreciated. Also, be sure to check out the Facebook page where I share things of interest to the channel concerning film, philosophy, and the NFL. And as always, I'm Black Angus. Have a great night. And may the soy be with you.